Thanks very much for the invite. This is a beautiful town that you, that you have here. Um, I am going to start with my talk uh, about 100,000 years ago. And I'm going to start more or less here in Cape Town with my talk. Just imagine what this place must have looked like about 100,000 years ago. I don't think much different from what we see here today, except for the buildings, of so, of course. But we were here as humans. We were here 100,000 years ago. In fact, the oldest science of abstract thinking was discovered in a cave not too far from here called Blombos. And uh, people lived in small groups, probably around here. But just imagine what life must have been like. We were mostly hunter-gatherers, walk around in small groups between, say, seven, five, seven, maybe, as, maybe not more than, say, 15 or so. The pressure on the environment was too, too much. We couldn't uh, form groups bigger than 15. But life was really tough. If we were lucky, we will grow to the wise old age of 25 years. But not only that, imagine if you want to eat something and you kill a rabbit, for example, you have to eat it straight away because if you don't, somebody else is going to eat it or perhaps eat you even. But important things like, for example, property rights did not exist. That was 100,000 years ago, which is not really that long ago. Then a couple of very important major economic breakthroughs happened. Around about 60,000 years ago, a small group of us left Africa and we populated the rest of the world. And then not much happened. And then approximately 15,000 years ago, a major economic breakthrough happened. And that was the first time that we domesticated animals. Some people argue actually that we were domesticated by the wolf, known as the dog today. But many other animals were domesticated as well. And suddenly, our lives started to change. We started producing much bigger surpluses. Our diet started to change. And the groups got much, much bigger. The problem with animals is they move, keep on moving around. So we kept on moving around as well. And then the major economic breakthrough. And now things really started to accelerate. Around about 8,000 years ago, when we first domesticated plants, especially grains. And now, unlike animals, plants sort of stick around. So we have to wait for the plants to ripen. And the diet started to change, and now we really produce a huge surplus, and many things start to change. Social structures started to change. We, you had the farmers and the soldiers, of course, the slaves were there, the priests were there, the parasites, the politicians were there as well. So that was what life was more around about 8,000 years ago. And we started and waiting around for the plants to ripen. And while we were waiting around for the plants to ripen, we started backing or uh, uh, stacking uh, uh, stones on top of each other and the word civilization means tall buildings. But many other things happened around about 12,000 years ago as well. The tax man all of a sudden appeared and he led to writing. That was a major economic breakthrough. Uh, tax, the, the tax man, the tax collector probably started with this art called writing. And some other major economic breakthroughs happened as well then. We discovered alcohol which I believe was a major economic breakthrough. And very importantly, we also discovered for the first time money. Now money is one of, I would argue, perhaps the greatest economic breakthrough, economic discovery ever. Imagine trying to, trying to do business with somebody without money. If, I want, if I've got a cow and I want to have a chicken, for example, and I now I have to find somebody uh, that's prepared to take my cow and give me 10 sheep and I have to exchange one sheep for 10 chickens. Now I sit with nine sheep and nine chickens I don't want. So it's very extremely difficult to, to transact without money. And the reason why we have developed the way we have developed is because we've transacted with each other. And more we can do business with one another, the more wealth we create and the more wealth we create, of course, the better for everybody. So the discovery of money evolved over time, of course, but the discovery of money was one of the major economic breakthroughs. In my, my, in my talk this morning, I will touch a little bit on money and what happened to money. And then, then things started happening really fast. We discovered all sorts of things. We experimented with political systems. Democracy, for example, was first tried about two, 3,000 years ago, and so on. We discovered recently things like, for example, steam power, electricity, and all sorts of amazing, wonderful things. And I would argue about a hundred years ago, one of the greatest economic breakthroughs happened, and that was when we first started sending our girl children to school. Of course, they went to school before that, 
but it became in most countries in the world approximately 100 years ago. It became compulsory for most girls to be sent to school. What happens if you send your girl children to school? All sort of things happen. First of all, the strongest contraceptive in the world is how long you send your girl children to school. Secondly, they of course influence their girls to go to school as well. And gradually over time, and it usually takes about two or three generations before you find women entering the professions after they start first going to school. Not only that, we also allowed women to participate in the formal economy, essentially doubling your workforce with people with excellent qualifications, and that resulted in this explosion of economic activity. It happened in the 1930s and 40s in the United States during their bra-burning revolution. It happened in the 1960s and 70s in Japan, for example. It happened, well, it's currently happening in countries like, for example, China. So that was probably the single most greatest economic breakthrough of all time. Money also evolved during the last couple of hundreds of years. And today we have money mostly in electronic form. Previously we had money in notes and coins, and we had money in the form of gold, for example. Just after the Second World War, we agreed on a couple of things. We agreed, for example, we should have more or less the same sort of political system. We call it democracy. Not everywhere. Democracy was important. Human rights were important. The protection of private property rights was important. We established institutions like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. We created a world government called the United States. And we decided on a world currency, and we called it the gold standard. So that was more or less what we decided upon and, uh, just after the Second World War. A hundred years ago, more than 90% of all people lived in abject poverty. And today that is less than 10% of the world. Within the next 10, maybe 20 years, we will get rid, completely eradicate abject poverty from amongst people on this planet. With maybe one or two exceptions, especially countries at war, but uh, a real... Poverty is something of the past. So the, the amount of wealth that we've created the last couple of decades is absolutely astonishing. And the progress we have made is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Just I mean, look at the Chinese, for instance. Within a matter of 30 years, they've, in fact, less than that, they've uplifted more than 600 million people out of total poverty. We've never seen so much wealth creation. But I think the, worlds are, the wheels are coming off. A couple of things that's happening. In 1971, for instance, Richard Nixon stepped off the gold standard. So we decided to change the agreement of just after the Second World War. And the, and the gold standard, or gold, was replaced by the mighty United States dollar as the world's currency. And remember, if you use somebody else's money, you are essentially paying a tax to that country. And that's part of the reason why the US economy is such a big and strong economy in the world today. Because we, all of us, when we trade internationally, we all pay a tax to the United States or to the U.S. economy. A couple of other things also changed the last couple of decades. Governments got bigger and bigger and bigger. And today governments are so big that the tax burden that they put on the economies are in many instances uh, smothering those economies. And I think South Africa is an excellent example. Not only that, governments have been borrowing like there is no tomorrow. And today the debt burdens of governments is the highest it has ever been. Central banks also initially were created literally to make money, but to, today central banks are these hugely uh, powerful institutions, and they decide about things like, for example, how to create money, make money, and literally they make money out of nothing quite often because we don't have the gold standard. And in some instances they print money and give it to the politicians and give it fancy names like quantitative easing, for example. So they make money, they've got certain monetary aggregates, they target inflation, they decide on the price of money, they're responsible for the financial markets, they're responsible for the banks, they're responsible for economic growth, they're even responsible for unemployment or employment then. Central banks have become these hugely powerful institutions. And in a way, what has happened initially, the idea was, after the Second World War, that you and I, the individual, will be at the center of the universe, and we've been pushed out, and today we have a new uber class, a new upper class, and they are the career politicians, and the career bureaucrats, and the career <coughs> central bankers. And I think the world is reacting to that. We've seen a couple of things happening in Europe, for instance. We saw Brexit. Now, we know the Brits 
the Brits, they, they like to order everybody around, but they do not like to be ordered around. And when the European Union told them to implement certain laws, they said, listen, I don't want to be part of this anymore. And they voted to leave the European Union. We saw what happened recently in places like, for example, Italy. We saw what happened in Spain. And I'm sure this European experiment, the Euro experiment, it will come under a lot of strain in coming years. In fact, I think one can even argue, <clears throat> and it doesn't matter what you think of Trump, but one can even argue that Trump is part of this new phenomenon, this move of new nationalism that we are experiencing internationally. He can, he's many things, Donald Trump, but he's certainly not part of the establishment, and that's why people are voting for Trump. There are two major economic developments taking place at the moment that certainly will affect small economies like South Africa, <clears throat> in fact, bigger economies as well, but two major international developments taking place. The one is a so-called trade war um, by Trump and the rest, essentially. Remember the U.S. economy is a large, relatively closed economy. The rest of the world, like for example, the South African economy, the South African economy is a small open economy, but everybody is pretty much de dependent on somebody else, with the exception of the Americans. The U.S. economy is such a large economy that they, are, they can pretty much run their own economy without any concern of the rest of, for, for the rest of the world. So this trade war is likely to, it's going to hurt everybody, but it's probably going to hurt the Americans less. But certainly the trade war can affect Small economies like South Africa, in fact, it is already affecting small economies like South Africa, but I think in the end, it's probably the Americans. Sorry? Their problem. Can I go on? Oh, come here. <clears throat> okay. But it's probably the Americans will be less affected by, by this trade war than there is. Uh, than anybody else. I also believe, and this is of course not on the front pages of the newspapers, that, uh, that Donald Trump is actually, and I'm not a great fan of Donald Trump, let me put that, make that clear, but Donald Trump is actually achieving quite a lot in many instances, but the newspapers, the especially Financial Times and CNN is certainly not putting that as main news items. Um, another development that is happening internationally is that interest rates are gradually increasing in internationally, or put differently, monetary policy is gradually being tightened by central banks, the big ones, internationally. The Federal Reserve in the United States, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, and especially also the Bank of Japan, they have followed a very, very loose monetary policy approach the last couple of years. What does that mean? It means they cut interest rates to very low levels. In fact, in some instances, below zero. Imagine a world with interest rates below zero. I'm an asset manager, people give me money and I invest it in, in different uh, financial instruments. And now if somebody gives me money in a world with a negative interest rates, I can give my uh, client a guarantee. I will guarantee him I'm going to give him back less than what's given me. That is what happens in a world of, of uh, uh, negative interest rates. So they're not only did they cut interest rates to very, very low levels, they also printed and created a lot of money out of nothing, but that process is being reversed gradually. We've seen the Federal Reserve gradually increasing interest rates the last couple of months, and they will probably continue with that, and we are going to see in future and get used to this new term, and that is quantitative tightening, where the Federal Reserve will gradually drain some of this liquidity out of the world financial markets. And not only them, eventually the European Central Banks and other major central banks will follow as well. And as interest rates go up in the United States, for example, and as Trump causes all this trouble with these with his trade wars, what happened? People run to where they feel safe, and they still feel safe in the United States, pushing up the dollar, and if the dollar goes up, other things go down, like, for example, the South African rand. Just one or two comments on a couple of economies, maybe the United States. The U.S. economy is absolutely cooking. The, un the unemployment levels at the in the U.S. economy is currently where it was, uh, I think, in the early 1980s. This is the last time when we saw unemployment at these very, very low levels. At 3.8%, that is unusually low uh, for, for any economy in the world. So the U.S. economy is absolutely cooking. The financial markets are at record high levels. One big potential threat coming from the U.S. is that their central bank may decide to increase interest rates too much, and there are many examples uh, the past hundred years or so when the Federal Reserve actually overdid things, where they increased interest rates too much, 
force, and this is a bit technical, forcing short-term interest rates up and actually forcing the U.S. economy into a recession. So that's something that I am a little bit concerned about, and that's probably the single biggest threat coming from the international environment, much more than the threat of the so-called uh, trade war. One or two other economies, the Japanese economy is not doing very well, but, uh, but, but, but if, if, you, if you adjust for the size of the population, which is a shrinking population, they are actually doing very, very well on a per capita basis. So on a macro basis, not well, but on a per capita basis, the Japanese are doing very well. Chinese economy is slowing down. There's one big threat possibly in, in China is that there's a huge overrun of debt and I'm a bit concerned about that. The economy that I really fancy, that I think is going to take the world uh, for the next couple of years, will be the star in the world, are the Indians. I believe that the Indian economy is going to cook. It's already growing much faster than the Chinese economy. You, the, South, uh, the, the, the Latin American economies, they are mostly dead in the water, and Russia is also pretty much dead in the water. I was in Russia not too long ago, and this rumor about the Russians... Drinking so much is not a rumor. I can promise you that. <laughs> okay, so that's what's happening in the world. Uh, coming to South Africa and a few comments about what's going on in South Africa. First of all, if you want to talk about South Africa, you have to understand politics in South Africa, and that's not an easy thing to do. Um, in fact, the only way that you can understand politics in South Africa is that you, you, you have to be born here. It's, I try to explain politics to some international journalists, and they, they, sometimes they think I'm joking. They say, this is just not possible. I mean, these sort of things. That, that, what? The guy resigned, then he went on leave, and he never actually resigned, and he came back. And <laughs> but, I mean, they can't understand this sort of stuff. All right, anyway, so what's going on in South Africa? I think it's important to kind of understand the history and the ideology of, of the, diff the important role players. First of all, the ANC. The ANC was a liberation organization, a quite a successful one. That turned itself into a new liberal kind of political party, pretty much center of the middle of the road kind of political party. I would call it a new liberalist kind of political party when it, when it came into power, which is quite unusual. Usually these liberation organizations, especially of the pink variety, they implement all sort of socialist policies, and that usually uh, leads to very weak, well, to the demise in many instances of the economies. Look what's happening to Venezuela, for instance. The ANC was certainly different, but recently the ANC... The original, the roots of the ANC is coming to the fore again. You can see the liberation organization is still there. And you can see it in all sorts of things, and I'll come back to that just now. A second role player, also in the tripartite alliance, is Kusatu, which essentially, it's certainly not representing workers in South Africa anymore. Kusatu today represents the civil service, mostly. Most of the Kusatu members are civil service. And since they're part of the tripartite alliance, they, of course, demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant of the tripartite alliance, they of course demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant of the tripartite alliance, they of course demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant of the tripartite alliance, they of course demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant of the tripartite alliance, they of course demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant of the tripartite alliance, they of course demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant of the tripartite alliance, they of course demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant of the tripartite alliance, they of course demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant of the tripartite alliance, they of course demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at 
at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant, in order to drive party the lines, they, of course, demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants. And the average civil servant, in order to drive party the lines, they, of course, demand their pound of flesh as as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants and the demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants and the demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever he is at that stage, uh, to spend more and more money in employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, whoever that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who at that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure on the Minister of Finance, who That stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure. That stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and demand their pound of flesh. As well, putting a lot of pressure. that stage, uh, to employing more civil servants and 
demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure at that stage uh, to destroying more civil servants. And the demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure at that stage uh, to destroying more civil servants. And the Demand their pound of flesh as well, putting a lot of pressure at that stage uh, to destroying more civil servants. And the
called a vibrant economy. And if you prevent businesses to close down, and if you prevent jobs to be destroyed, then you also make it difficult for the economy to create new businesses and to create new kinds of jobs. And in future, a lot of people's jobs <coughs> will, in fact, disappear, but a lot of new jobs will be created as well. Now look at the countries in the world that is te technologically the most advanced countries in the world, the United States, with a lot of technology in that economy, with unemployment levels less than 4%. The same goes to the Japanese, technologically very advanced, and the Koreans, the, techno the South Koreans, of course, very technologically advanced, but very, very low levels of unemployment. And do not see technology as a threat to your, to your job. See technology as an opportunity. But there's one thing that you need to do, and that is you have to make sure that you stay on top of new technological developments. And there are many things happening. One thing that I am so, so excited about is blockchain. And I just want to touch on that a little bit. What is blockchain essentially? Blockchain is a platform where people exchange information. Now let me just make a very important point. Please don't run out there and go and invest your money in Bitcoin or in any one of these funny things. But I do advise you to download an app and buy 100 rands worth of Bitcoin or whatever you want to buy and play with this. Because this new technology is going to change the way we do business. This new technology will allow us to transfer in a quite a secure manner value between two individuals. And if we can transfer value between two individuals directly from one cell phone to the next, next cell phone without going via a financial intermediary like a bank, transaction costs will come down. Even further, if transaction costs come down, people will transact more. If we transact more, we will create more wealth. And if we create more wealth, we will become wealthier, of course, get rid of unemployment and poverty. And, and that is the future of technology. And see this new technology as another opportunity. But you have to make sure that you stay on top of these kinds of technologies. And then maybe on a slightly philosophical level, this new technology will allow us, and in fact you are all part of this new world already, this technology will allow us to transfer wealth between individuals. We can do it anonymously, and since we can do it anonymously, the new Minister of Finance will find it much more difficult to tax us. So in future we're probably going to see that change in tax regimes. He may come to me and ask me how much Bitcoin or how much Ethereum or how much of these cryptocurrencies I have on my cell phone. What am I going to tell him? I'm going to tell him I forgot my password. So those are the sort of challenges. <laughs> those are the sort of challenges that the new ministers of finance will, uh, will, will have to face. In fact, there are even central banks considering issuing their own so-called cryptocurrencies. But more importantly, what is happening is that power is being removed and taken away from those bureaucrats and the ineptocrats and the politicians. And power goes where it's supposed to be and it's in the hands of the individuals. And imagine, in future, this thing that we call a country won't really exist anymore, because now you can be anywhere. All you need is a connection, and you can be part of this new, wonderful, modern world. And you can join the Flat Earth Society if you want to. You just need a connection somewhere and create your own community somewhere in a cloud. And I think over time, what we're probably going to see is that this these national entities that we call countries or whatever it is, is probably going to become much more relevant, or much less relevant than what we have mm. up to now. Thank you very much right. well done, for listening Harry. to me.